Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Once again, I have the great privilege of welcoming back to the channel, John McHugh. And today, we're going to be talking about the pan-human need to turn the sun god at the winter solstice. Over to you, John. Thank you so much for having me, Esoteric and Esoteric Thoughts, uh, the whole podcast. It's a pleasure. Um, as we step into this, uh, I call it the winter solstice season, um, we're leading up to really the last three to four weeks before the winter solstice occurs. And um, the winter solstice is has been a, a, a dire and perilous time for humanity since our inception. Um, especially for agricultural societies. Uh, and we'll talk about that. That's what I thought we could talk about uh, on today's uh, show, especially from the perspective of the Pueblo Indian people, uh, because they have some very beautiful ideas and rituals. And I'd like to relate them. In the end, I'd like to relate them to the, the Yule season celebrated by the ancient Germanic tribes, Sol Invictus, the, the Greco-Roman uh, unconquered sun, uh, sometimes embodied in Mithras, uh, and also um, just just the idea that the, the sun was conceptualized as a deity uh, by almost all human beings that have ever existed in pre-scientific society. So there's something uh, that connects us with the sun at the winter solstice. It's a beautiful time, and I hope I, hope I can convey the emotion that that I experience when I go out and see a lot of the, the Native American rock art uh, that I research uh, when I'm out here in the in the the southwestern de desert of the United States. I'm up in Salt Lake City. So, so. but having said that, uh, how about if I share my screen and um, I will pull that up. Let me get it on full screen. Okay. All right. So I always have to, I've written the book, The Celestial Code of Scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And, you know, I, I published with the small publishing house. So uh, it's part of my contract to try to sell the book whenever I can. So there it is. Uh, if you had to summarize it, it uh, the Celestial Code of Scripture reveals the supreme esoteric doctrine of the ancient world. And that's that the constellations depicted still frames of monumental incidents that had taken place on Earth. Polysemus or alternate readings for the oldest cuneiform signs used to spell out the constellation titles in each astral picture story divulged the action and details that were taking place. And religious astrologers like the Magi who followed the star of Bethlehem to the birth site of baby Jesus, they arranged uh, the jumbled array of stellar picture stories or snapshots and their accompanying uh, word plays, missives, uh, polysemy uh, into stories or narratives. And these, these narratives were recorded as the miracles described in pagan, uh, Judaic, Christian, and Islamic scriptures. That's what the book's about. And half of my research is on that, but the other half um, is spent. Um, so I went to, I earned my master's degree in archaeology at Brigham Young University, and it afforded me the chance to study a bunch of ancient languages. However, uh, I also uh, gained an expertise in, um, in a study of uh, prehistoric Native American cultures of the Southwest. And um, so I'm a permitted Utah archaeologist, uh, and I really, I'd have to say, I specialize in rock art. When I go in the field, uh, as an archaeologist, I'm almost exclusively there to find, uh, categorize, and steward prehistoric Native American rock art. Um, and oftentimes that is connected to archaeoastronomy, which is the study of how ancient peoples understood and utilized astronomical knowledge. So it's a little different than the way we do it now because we have science. And the cultures I'm studying are pre-scientific. Um, I'm the lead archaeologist for the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project, which was founded by my uh, co-researcher, John Lundvall, 
Uh, John Lundball is an archaeoastronomer who specializes in oral cultures, which is perfect because almost every rock art site that we go to has been, uh, well, not almost, every rock art site that we go to has been pecked or painted by a, an oral culture, a culture that was uh, pre-literate, does not use writing. I'm also an archaeologist for the Utah Rock Art Research Association, uh, and I do a lot of research with them. Uh, there's, by the way, there's my research partner, John Lundvall. Uh, he's written a book, uh, Myth, uh, Mythos and Cosmos, Mind and Meaning in the Oral Age. Um, we, uh, what I'm going to present today, his name will come up many, many times because we worked for couple years on uh, this uh, one, well, several petroglyphs that we found at Fremont Indian State Park, but one in particular. But I wanna uh, take uh, your viewers to the concept of the winter solstice. We know it now as Christmas, uh, uh, pagan Germanic tribes would have called it Yule. The Pueblo Indians that I study in the American Southwest refer to it as uh, Soyal. Um, and it's the solstice, we think of it as the, the shortest day of the year, but the, the sun actually stays, it, it stays, it rises and sets imperceptibly at the same spot for about four days. So it's a little bit uh, more than just one day. It's actually about a four day process. And then on that fifth day, you can again begin to see that the sun has moved northward. In, in pre-scientific cultures, this was a dire moment. This was a crucial moment. You had to figure out how to appease or somehow co convince or coax the sun god into choosing to go northward again which is why so many winter solstice rituals exist. They're all there for the same exact reason. The sun is going to make a choice. If it keeps going south, we're an agri agrarian society. We live by planting. We're all going to die. If it moves north again, we'll have warmth and we'll have, you know, bountiful crop growth, harvests, and food. So I just showed a still friend that's somewhere. It looks like Arizona. But uh, you can see the summer solstice sunrise in the middle is the, e the equinox sunrise and then the winter solstice sunrise. So the title of this presentation, I thought, uh, it, I just thought it just came to me. It's, I just call it the pan-human need to turn the sun god at winter solstice. But I'm really going to give you a Pueblo Indian perspective. Um, and I, I hope I can just convey the, the beauty and the passion that you see in Native American ceremonies uh, of the Southwest. So this is originally based on a paper uh, that uh, John Lundvall and I and the, uh, the uh, curator, the former curator of the Fremont Indian State Park Museum wrote. It's called Using Ethnographic Analogy to Interpret the Function and Meaning of the Solar Lunar Petroglyph at Fremont Indian State Park. That's an awful title. That is so scholarly, it's just boring even to read. Um, so that's why I named it uh, <laughs> Turning the Sun God, a pan-human uh, need, right? So um, it, this paper was published in American Indian Rock Art. And I just want to emphasize uh, with your viewers that in the American West, there are literally hundreds of thousands of Native American pictographs and petroglyphs, these rock art panels. They're incredibly primal. They are uh, proclamations of human thought everywhere you turn, and they're, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so you can specialize as an art historian or an archaeologist or an anthropologist in, a, in just Native American rock art, uh, and many people do. I, there are certainly many, many people better than me, but I, but I certainly have a pretty strong familiar, familiarity with Southwestern Native American rock art. So the cultures that we're pretty much dealing with are right there. So I'm up in Salt Lake City in the Northern part of Utah where you see the word Fremont. Then you see the word Anasazi. Then you see the word Hokam. And then you see Mugion. Uh, the retainers of the purple area there is a kind of a, a quirky 
distinction that I'm not going to go into that archaeologists get in fistfights over. But um, so I want you to just be aware that the Fremont and the Anasazi are now referred to as ancestral Pueblo, and they are the ancestors of the Native Americans that today live at the Pueblo villages, uh, especially in New, New Mexico and Arizona, and especially along the Rio Grande River and uh, at the uh, Hopi Pueblos uh, near Flagstaff, Arizona. So the Clear, the Clear Creek Canyon Archaeological Project. So basically what happened in the mid 1980s, early to mid 1980s, uh, if you look at that photograph right there, on the left, there's this little two lane highway. Well, that was eventually expanded into a major in interstate highway that goes across the United States called Interstate 70. And when they were building that highway, they have to have archeologists do what's called salvage archeology. span You're just trying to find uh, archeological uh, information and, and document it. And as they did that, they came across this gigantic, what we, we call them the Fremont people, but they're multiple tribes. They're really just ancestral Puebloan people. They live in the high desert. They're agrarian, so they're relying on corn, beans, and squash for food. As you can see, it's an amazingly beautiful area. Those squares you see are actually archaeological excavations. These areas were going to be destroyed because they were going to use this whole site, which had, I forget how many homes, but probably 60 to 120 Native Americans living in, in it for 200 years. Um, they're going to use this for fill for the highway. So uh, there's another one. This is from like about 1984. There's a photograph of a bulldozer from a plane uh, and they're doing some archeological excavation there. So as they did the excavations, they retrieved so much material culture. They found so many ancient pit houses that uh, they gleaned a ton of information on what we today call the, the Fremont culture or the Fremont people of uh, Utah. And but what they also found are over 3,000 uh, prehistoric Native American rock art panels. It was documented in a, in a scholarly book called uh, Rock Art of Clear Creek Canyon in Central Utah. And by the way, this is uh, was done in, uh, con in conjunction with the Ute tribe. Uh, who worked with the Office of Public Archaeology. And this is a scholarly work. This is for archaeologists. So uh, this is what John Lundvall and I were referring to when we were going to take a, we were going to re-examine the artifacts that were taken uh, during this multi-year excavation and, and review again the 3,000 rock art panels. So it took us a couple of years to do this. Um, this is an amazing picture. This is the oldest site in the uh, park. It's the Sheep Shelter Cave. It's a small cave. You can see that there are petroglyphs on the inside. They could date back the, the earliest hearth date in that. Uh, this is John Lundball. His night shots are astonishing, but, um, but uh, they, the earliest dates might go back to 3500 BC. That's what the radiocarbon date said. And then for whatever reason, uh, the sheep, this, we call it the sheep shelter, was abandoned in about 700 AD. John Lundvall believes that it continued to be used because it's an outstanding observatory. You can just be in the mouth of this cave and you can view uh, the, the uh, rising and setting of the sun, the moon, uh, and the stars in a remarkable fashion. He has a whole show on that. Um, and as you're walking around, and for, there, there was so much rock art, they actually made it a state park. And they actually uh, put all of the artifacts that were discovered in, into a, they built a museum called Fremont Indian State Park and Museum. So you're walking around, here's newspaper rock where you just see <laughs> just hundreds of petroglyphs pecked into this rock. The darker they are, they are the older they are. All kinds of images. Uh, this is called the severe style. It's, it's, a, it's a rock art style called the severe style. Uh, here's a 
Here's a petroglyph that's actually been painted. Notice at the bottom of that horned figure, there are rakes. Whenever you see rakes, that pretty much means rain or water runoff. Here's an interesting one. Uh, you see a beautiful petroglyph there on the left, especially of a like a shaman holding what looks like a some kind of uh, blessing stick or uh, staff and some kind of maybe basket that is carrying ritual items. Bighorn sheep were ubiquitous. They're all over the rock art in hundreds of thousands of panels throughout the American Southwest. There's an interesting bighorn sheep with the sun next to it. Remember, there's 3,000 of these, and I'm not going to go into them because what John Lundvall and I were looking for are, um, uh, well, he, he coined a very interesting term. While we were there looking at all these, we went to almost every one of the 3,000 panels. And he noticed that I, out of 3,000, like about other maybe 10 weren't facing the between the winter solstice sunrise and the winter solstice sunset, almost all of the rock art falls within that window. And John coined the term that these this, these pic, petroglyphs and pictographs are sun writing. It's almost as if they're tracking the winter solstice sun. And as you when you go there and you start whipping out your compass and taking your your uh, z, azimuth readings, you're like, oh wow. This is like, these guys are just looking at the winter solstice sun. You, you start to feel part of the rhythm of, of what it would have been like to be a Fremont uh, Indian uh, a thousand years ago. When we were going and going out to the sites, we were going, remember, we're going back and revisiting rock art that was cataloged in the mid 1980s. So we kept finding the pin flags that they were using. Here's one from probably 1984 or 1985. That's a night shot from Fremont Indian State Park. Astonishing. You can see everything there. It's just astonishing. Um, and that's, a, of course, one of John Lundfall's uh, great skills is his night shots are amazing. You just go out there and I, I'm often hauling his equipment, and setting it up for him. So. <laughs> so, this is where I get, this is my specialty, right? So this is the archaeology that's done there. This is a pit house. This is what your prototypical Pit House of Fremont Indian State Park looks like. Uh, when you excavate it, you can see a central fire hearth. That's what it would have been look, looked like when people inhabited it. These pit houses are entered through a, uh, a hole in the roof through a ladder. They're easy to keep warm because they're semi-subterranean. So they stay like around 65, 68 degrees, even when it's snowing outside because you're in the earth. A little tiny fire hearth can warm the whole pit house very readily. That's what it would have looked like in excavation. They're starting to, they're trying to reconstruct this one, but you can see how it would have been built. There's also a ramada at this uh, site that we're working at. They call it Five Finger Ridge. That's the archeological designation for this site. It's called Five Finger Ridge. For a time, it was the largest known Fremont Indian habitation that was ever excavated. And it became the place of a Fremont Indian State Park. And I mean, this place is in the middle of nowhere. You're three hours south of Salt Lake City and you don't have phone contact. Your cell phone's only in a few places. You have cell, cell reception. You are out in the middle of nowhere and uh, you are in a beautiful place. There's a picture of it on a map. Uh, it's about three hours south of Salt Lake City. But with John, John Lundvall is the one, he was doing a, 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 some archaeoastronomy research there and he kept seeing these wheels and these numbers these certain amount of dots oftentimes there were 39 we're trying to figure out what that meant but uh, we're looking at this one if you look there's a hole up in the top above that um that rock art panel we call this the sun wheel um it appears to have functioned as some kind of gnomon uh and you can see when you put a stick in you get a shadow and you could easily tell time uh by this petroglyph right here. Uh, and John has a uh, wonderful series of photographs showing that this is probably this, we call it the, the sun wheel petroglyph, that it's probably a calendar. He did most of the research on this one. And then we both did the most of the research on this one. We call this the sheep spiral. This is the summer solstice. You can see Bighorn sheep don't have spirals on their back, nor do they have tails with 
seven little squares etched into them. This is a calendrical de device connected to whatever big horn sheep meant to the Pueblo Indians. They are a great source of, uh, of protein for the, the Pueblo Indian people and uh, the ancient Fremont people. But this is the summer solstice. Notice it aligns with the spiral on the back of the sheep and then on the left side of that spiral. Sadly, it's been defaced with a bullet hole. You can see that um, some uh, redneck just probably in the 1940s or 50s shot that out. This is the same site at the vernal equinox. Um, again, this, this is a solar observation site. This is a calendar. And then uh, for about 45 seconds to a minute at the winter solstice, the sunlight aligns with the right side of that uh, spiral uh, wheel, whatever you want to call it. And the idea that that happened by chance is really hard to imagine. Notice there's a guy in the figure. He's the president of the Utah Rock Art Research Association. So um, he gets, all, he, he funds all of our grants. So if he wants to stand in the way of your picture, you let him, you know what I mean? So <laughs> that's Steve Acerson, his name is. He's a wonderful guy and an incredible source of knowledge for Native American prehistoric, Native American rock art. So we're wondering if some of these sites are solar observation sites. This is from Chaco Canyon. This is a very famous pictograph. Many people believe that this is the image of the 1050 Crab Nebula that exploded in 1050 AD and is depicted in the rock art at Chaco Canyon. Um, this would face Southeast. So it's facing that image. The problem I have with that interpretation is that these same Im images are also found at solar observation site. It's at basically at what you would call sun shrines to deduce the calendar. But when we were going through that booklet, the rock art of Clear Creek Canyon, again, it's written for archeologists. It just gives you public uh, off OPA numbers, they call them, they just give you number after number and they just describe the rock art with a little bit sometimes there's some sketches and that sketch hit me and i went whoa that sketch said a million things to me so i'm looking at it it's interlocking suns everybody says oh it's a you know it's a you know it's an eclipse but the problem is there's a crescent moon below it and you never have a crescent moon with an eclipse it's not possible so it's it's a demure little panel you're not going to lose any sleep over it. You're not going to make it a, a major tourist destination. It's only about 40 centimeters long. And there it is on the left. If you look there, there's interlocking suns and a little crescent moon. And uh, I just want to give you a feel for what we're, what we're doing here. So you can see the highway that they put in. And then they built that road that leads into the, the Fremont Indian State Park and Museum. Notice there's like what looks like an anthill and a black arrow in the, in the middle of your screen. That's where the excavation of Five Finger Ridge was done. It's about a half mile away. And that's about the distance that uh, solar observations sites and sun shrines are positioned at uh, Native American sites uh, in the Pueblos. So they're just far enough away because remember the the sun priest is also, he's got his own fields. He's got to plant his fields. He can't be 10 miles away. He's got work to do for his tribe and for his family. So they're often, you could make an observation, but then you could get back to the village. So there it is right there on your left, demure little petroglyph. No one's going to, again, build a, it's, you're not going to make that a tourist destination. There it is up close, very small. You can see interlocking suns. You can see a crescent moon. They're even defined by sunbursts by the Ute tribe. So I felt pretty confident that in the interpretations that they're interlocking suns and a crescent moon. So there they are again, but look down at the bottom of that picture, you'll see what looks like a little cigar at the bottom of that figure. And I was out there and you gotta remember, I, I might've been only a handful of people that have gone to this site since it was pecked. 
And I looked, was looking closer at that little thing on the ground. And I was like, oh, that's a corn cob. So that's a thousand year old corn cob right below this site, uh, this, this petroglyph. So got me thinking, okay, maybe. So the question you got to ask is, so this is what John Lindvall and I are asking. I, and I pulled John Lindvall over to the site. I said, why did an agriculturally dependent prehistoric Native American heck interlocking suns and a crescent moon on a cliff face? And, you know, John Lindvall and I, of course, the answer might lie with uh, the living descendants of the Pueblo Indian people that once inhabited Fremont Indian State Park. The Pueblo Indians that, are, that today live in New Mexico and Arizona. So again, we're worrying about that sun. When you're standing with the petroglyph, the interlocking sun, crescent moon petroglyph at your back, it literally frames that image. That is the winter solstice in like 2018 or 2019. I'm literally standing with the petroglyph to my back. It's, it's there to frame that. Now, what's interesting, if you're standing there looking at the winter solstice sunset and you turn just like this, you're suddenly looking at the winter solstice sunrise, which is found in a very distinct notch. You can see it right there. That is the winter solstice sunrise. I think we photographed this in 2020. We were out there at the, the winter solstice. Uh, and um, so what happens is at this petroglyph, this is literally photographed with the petroglyph at your back, you can watch the whole rising of the winter solstice sunrise and setting of the winter solstice sunset and almost every one of the 3000 rock art panels seems to be coordinated to focus on that directionality, to either get the sunrise, the sunset, or somewhere in between. So the Fremont and Anasazi people that if you look at any of the old textbooks on Southwestern archeology, span they'll use the term Fremont and Anasazi. It's the mitochondrial DNA unequivocally shows that they're ancestral Puebloan, that the Pueblo people today identify the Fremont people as their ancestors. In fact, some Pueblo Indians believe they can go out and actually read the rock art the way we would read a book. So, and that also leads to the great mystery of Southwestern archeology. span So any, uh, there's anybody, any, uh, you know, teenagers or children watching this show, I just want to pose, this is the great mystery. Uh, maybe one of you will grow up and be able to answer the, give the answer to this mystery because, uh, the ancestral Puebloan people that occupied Utah and Colorado, they just abandoned the sites. I mean, they look like they just ate dinner and left. It, it's like this mass migration out of where you see the word Fremont in Utah and you see Colorado and to the right of it. Everywhere that you see Utah and Colorado, where it's Fremont and Anasazi, thousands upon thousands of sites were just, they were just absolutely abandoned. And they moved down to the giant Pueblos that we know today where the modern Pueblo Indians live. So put that in perspective, that's where there are. New Mexico, most of them are along the Rio Grande River. Uh, you see the little arrow there to a place called Jemez. Jemez Pueblo is um, the mitochondrial DNA of the, free, the 20 bodies they did take DNA from showed that the the Jemez Pueblo and people and the Fremont people are from the, the same matriarchal lineage. Um, and then there's some other uh, Pueblos, the Zuni Pueblo, there's Acoma there's uh, Laguna. Up in the north, if you look at the very top Pueblo, is Taos, which is a very famous Pueblo. And um, then there's 13 different Pueblos on the Hopi Mesas. So here's an example, Mesa Verde was abandoned. There's another image of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's artifacts all over the place. Pots left, food left, mass migration. That's what's called a kiva. When you see a circular structure at these ancient Puebloan sites, it's basically what's called a, it's like an underground church. It's semi-subterranean, would have a roof. There's a kiva right there. There's me coming out of a Kiva. That's a Pecos Pueblo, a reconstructed Kiva there. That probably dates to, I think Pecos 
Kiva probably, it's a little late. It's probably dates to 15 or 1600. It's my wife in the same Kiva. As you can see, you enter it you know, through a, a ladder. Um, that, that square in the wall is the ventilator shaft and they build a, a, a brick structure around the fire hearth so that the air that's blowing in doesn't blow out the fire. Oftentimes in the Northern Pueblos, you have a religious uh, relic, a feature. It's called a Sipepu or Sipapu or Shipapu, depending on uh, which dialect of Hopi you're looking at. The Sipapu is the place of emergence. You see it in these underground churches called kivas. And it's the, the Pueblo Indians believe they came from an underworld, maybe climbing up on a ladder, maybe climbing up on a tree trunk, maybe climbing up on, on reeds, but they came up from an underworld and they show that in their sacred kivas with this sipapu. It's, it's, a, it's a reminder of the Christian and Judaic version of uh, Genesis. It's sort of the same thing. It's their Adam, uh, their Adam and Eve story. There's Taos Pueblo. You can go there. It's built between 11 and 1400. There's trucks parked on the side. Yeah, just just your typical 900 900 year old house. You know, I, it's just astonishing when you go there. You just you just draw drops. It, it it's just beautiful. So this is Jemez Pueblo, 1915. So want, I just want to treat your readers. I want your readers to feel immersed in the winter solstice. So this is the Hopi Indian uh, farmer. He's, he's about 1900. This is very much what it would have looked like in a thousand, a thousand years ago at uh, Fremont Indian State Park. This is what you would have seen. Uh, just, just to connect to this, this is when you see a uh, horals in a Hopi maiden's hair it means this woman's uh, this young beautiful young woman is uh, unmarried. It means she's of marrying age. But notice the horals. That's uh, Princess Leia uh, in Star Wars. That's where Princess Leia got the idea from the Hopi maiden. So I just want to connect um, your viewers to real human beings. I mean, I mean, look at how beautiful that young woman is. Um, uh, just it almost brings tears to my eyes. Um, but here's where we get serious. Uh, the Pueblo and pan-human concept of the sun and moon. That is the, uh, the Eastern Pueblo image of the sun god. That's, that's what the sun god's face uh, looked like. Uh, that's the New Mexico flag. If you know it, if you notice, it's from the Zia Pueblo. Uh, the red uh, image is the sun. It's the sun god. The yellow image is maize or corn, which the sun made grow which gives life and sus sustenance to the, the community. This is an image of the sun deity. Uh, it's actually a dancer in uh, the, uh, the Pueblo Indian uh, winter solstice ceremony called Soya. Uh, and this is one of the dancers, it's Tawa the sun god. Tawa just means sun or sun deity in Hopi. This is Moyu. Moyu is the, uh, the moon god, uh, and has a very crucial role as well at the winter solstice. But I'm trying to give, the, these are real paintings by Native Americans. You can't go into the kivas anymore. The Hopi have outlawed it since about 1919. Um, they're, you're not allowed to photograph at all. In fact, if you photograph during uh, a kiva dance, they will come and take your com camera and rightly so uh, confiscate your camera, and rightly so. Uh, it would be the same as uh, if someone who was an atheist came into uh, uh, a, a Christmas mass and just started taking photographs and pictures du during the ceremony. It would be considered that sacrilegious. Um, you are allowed to watch, though, and if you've ever seen a Kachina dance, you, you'll be mesmerized. Again, so the probable ended depiction of the sun god. That is a, the Pequin, the sun priest at Zuni Pueblo is in uh, southwestern, west central New Mexico. Zuni speaks just Zuni language. It's in, in essence a sky island because of how it was situated. 
the Zuni Pueblo and the Zuni people, although they traded with the other Puebloans, they retained their own language. This is their sun priest from about 1896. That's one of his sun shrines. Um, this one's, uh, I think it's pronounced Masakia. Uh, you can see in the image, there's a slab and there's a picture of the sun god on it. Uh, Pekwin literally means uh, speaking place. It's where the sun god spoke to the sun priest to reveal when to have the ceremonies because you had to do the ceremonies at the precise time. Not only are the ceremonies spiritual, but they're connected to the agricultural cycle and they ensure the uh, plant growth that's needed to make the corns, bean, the corns uh, corn, bean and squash grow properly so that there's plenty of food for the community. There's a close up. Again, this is from about 1896. You can see the sun god, the face of the sun god there. Okay, so this is, there is a guy named uh, Alexander Stephen who lived with the Hopi Indians uh, in the 1890s. Uh, he was actually just a, a he, he owned a, a, a trading post. So he traded, uh, you know, like metal tools and cooking utensils uh, with the Hopi Indians for various things that they were doing, like making blankets and things like that. And um, he actually became fluent in uh, Hopi and he actually lived with them for three years. He was considered part of the tribe and he actually witnessed the winter solstice ceremony. He's one of the few white people that did. And he showed how they made their observations they're on the roof of the Bear Clan house. They're looking at sunset. They began the winter solstice observations on December 2nd. On December 10th, they made the announcement that uh, at this place called Luhafru, and that is the moment that the sun priest would announce, we've got to have the summer solstice occur, you know, 11 days from today. And their uh, winter solstice ceremony, uh, they would have marked calendar sticks. Here's a couple different calendar sticks. One is uh, the Odom people, the Akimo, the, the river people of uh, Arizona. Uh, the, the, the string tie I'm wearing is the Tohono O'odham, uh, the Akimo uh, O'odham are the river people. I believe the Tohono O'odham are the desert people. The calendar stick on the left is about 1900. The calendar stick on the right is probably 1920s, it's Hopi. Anyway, they would often mark how many days it was going to be until the winter solstice fell in case it was cloudy and you couldn't make an exact uh, observation. So Sol so Yao is the Hopi tone for the winter solstice and the accompanying ceremonies. Uh, it actually has a kachina, there, there they are. Uh, in some, in some of the Hopi Kachinas, uh, it was depicted, uh, the winter solstice Soyal ceremony was depicted as seen on the left, and others it was depicted as seen on the right. Notice that they have a branch, like a sacred branch they're carrying. They cover, there's a rattle in their right hand, sacred branch in their left hand. So you had to know the exact moment of the winter solstice because it was crucial that the Pueblo Indians, uh, uh, you know, enact prayers and ceremonies that would coax the sun god back, teach the sun god, hey, we, we've got to bring you back. If not, you're going to keep moving southward and you're going to roll right off the horizon and we're going to all freeze to death. You're going to end all life on earth. And that's the, that's the dire uh not, you know, wisdom that pre-scientific uh, hum humans held if you were in the Northern Hemisphere. You had, if you were in Africa, if you were in Europe, if you were in, uh, you know, the, the, on the Pueblos, you had to turn the sun god. You had to um, know exactly when you, you en engaged in the proper rituals to turn the sun god back. If you messed up, the sun god might not come back and you would all perish. So again, I, I'm just gonna quote some great scholars here. Michael Zielik is a, uh, he just recently died. He's a, um, 
he was a New Mexico astronomer, but he was very knowledgeable about the Pueblo and calendar. And he writes that sun watching sets the calendar for two main purposes, to establish the ritual cycle and set a planting calendar. Agricultural and religion are so intertwined in the Pueblos that they reinforce each other. So there you have the sun priest. There's his, uh, his sun shrine where he made his solar observations. Uh, a San Ildo, Aldefonso Pueblo elder, uh, this is along the Rio Grande River in New Mexico. He says, there are two livings. There's agriculture and there's religion. They're the same thing. You practice agriculture and then you do the religious ceremonies connected to it. Then you do the religious ceremonies and then you go out and plant and work your fields. They're, there's, they're one in the same. I thought that was a very uh, interesting comment. Uh, we don't, we don't, in our day of shopping in uh, supermarkets, we don't understand that. We don't understand living the calendar the way a Pueblo Indian would. We, we live, we can go off to, you know, here the, you know, in Salt Lake City, there's the Smith supermarket that has everything. And I'm sure there's one in London that I don't know the name of. But uh, anyway, it's not like that on the Pueblos. The, another one uh, at Zuni, where the, uh, remember the, uh, the Pequin, the sun priest that we were talking about? Well, that Pueblo, they have the Shalako Festival. It's the winter solstice ceremony. And it's these giant bird-like uh, images that people danced and, uh, and they, they dressed up as these shalako. They, some of them are nine, 10 feet tall. Um, and there's people, of course, inside uh, as they did their ritual dances. You can see them in the petroglyphs. On the left, you can see a shalako. Uh, this is in New Mexico. Uh, and there's one there on the right. Um, the one on the left, uh, oftentimes crosses are not Christian crosses, they're stars. They often represent the, uh, the Venus as the morning star or the evening star. So again, we go back to the Pueblo and concepts of the sun god. There's the Tawa, the sun god in Hopi. Uh, there's his image uh, when he's depicted as a dancer. And there's a pan Pueblo in belief that if the northern turn did not occur, the sun would roll off the edge of the world into the underworld, and this would be, and thus we'd all be uh, plunge everyone into death and darkness. At Santa Clara Pueblo, which you can see right there, there's the ancient ruins of it. Um, they tell, they told the anthropologist that the Sun Father goes as far south as he wants to go. Then when he gets there, he does not know whether he wants to go north or south. And so we watch him come up in the morning. He seems to hesitate which way to go. Then we have to help him and to make medicine so that he knows how to go. And when they say make medicine, they're, they're talking about religious prayers, which rituals and dances. It's the, the exact same thing you uh, that a Christian does. For instance, when I go to a Catholic mass at Christmas, I'm doing the same thing. I'm praying to have an outcome. I'm praying to God to have an outcome, to engage in the magic that's necessary on earth to help a sick loved one, to help my sick neighbor, to um, ensure that uh, my grandchild is healthy um, and uh, you know, to make sure that all of the loved ones that we have on this earth uh, are cared for and are healthy and happy. So they're doing the same thing. Only one of the things they have to do, they've got an, a secondary problem. They actually have to turn the sun god. Um, and if not, everybody dies. Um, at Kachiti Pueblo, uh, they called it Hanyiko, uh, farewell to the sun. And uh, the famous uh, Elsie Clues Parsons is a famous uh, about turn of the century. When I say century, I mean 20th century. Uh, she's an anthropologist, lived with many of the Puebloan tribes, and she says that, you know, in her collection of uh, anthropological wisdom that was given to her, the sun father or sun old man visits the summer and winter solstice points for four days, four days each. But being an old man and unstable, he must be helped on his journey. He must be turned or pulled back. Um, and again, that's connected to that idea. The sun waits for four days at the summer solstice. You must turn him 
or else he's going to go off of, he's going to roll right off into the underworld. Same thing at the winter solstice. The summer solstice is more concerned with rainmaking in the desert. Winter solstice is just flat out. It's freezing cold. Although you think of the desert as very warm, it, at nighttime, it is freezing cold in the desert, especially for these uh, agricultural cultures. So again, here's another, just another Provo Indian comment. There's uh, Florence Hawley Ellis. She says that since it appeared that the sun hesitated a few days in his Southern house, the Pueblos deemed it wise to put on a ceremony, which would spur his decision to again, take up his march northward. And that shows up. Uh, many anthropologists have talked about the dances. Again, you're not allowed to view these dances, but here's the Soyal ceremony at Hopi. Um, the, drama, the dance is actually a dramatization of the sun's motion or progress, uh, uh, which was a significant part of the winter solstice ceremony. It's a, it reenacted via a ritual performance in which a religious official impersonates the impetuous sun guide by using a sun symbol or a sun shield that is twirled wild, wildly by the Hopi star priest, while simultaneous, simultaneously making mimic assault towards ceremonial singers who chant songs and prayers while constraining the sun god's motion. The drama represents the sun deity beginning his yearly sun-bearing journey, but hesitating whether or not to travel over the Hopi region at winter solstice. And this ritual society of singers thus display or typify their efforts to constrain him, to his accustomed path. In essence, what they're trying to do is in this dance, make the sun god turn. It's, it's sympathetic magic. If I, make you, if I make the sun god turn during this uh, ritual in the Kiva, then we will allow the sun god to turn on the horizon uh, and bring us warmth and uh, fecundity in the upcoming spring. And you see it uh, uh, at Christmas. You know, Christmas is a celebration of the, the birth of Jesus, and it's also Jesus's birthday on December 25th is when the sun makes his turn. The sun God makes his turn. So I'll just give a couple more quotes. The winter solstice cer ceremonies at the Pueblos, although they differ in detail, are uniformly designed for the purpose of turning the sun and setting him on his true northward course. Uh, Misha Titiev, who was an anthropologist living at the Hopi uh, Pueblos, uh, he says the main purpose of the Soyal, which is the winter solstice, is to perform compulsive magic at winter solstice so that the sun may in be induced to start back towards its summer home and none br thus bring suitable warmth and warm weather to permit the Hopi to plant their fields. What must be understood, however, is that the winter solstice ceremonies simultaneously aim to ensure plentiful crops and general prosperity and good health for the next season. Again, it's crucial to turn that sun god. So one of the things that uh, that guy Alexander Stephen mentions is he watched the whole winter solstice uh, ceremonial uh, process, the many ceremonies and the offerings they made. One of them, he watched them make these little wooden, about 15 center, centimeter wooden corn effigies. And there's a lot of prayers in the Kiva. Here's the two horned priests. And I was wondering, is the modern Pueblo Indian wooden corn effigy a vestige of a time when real corn ears were offered at winter solstice sites? For instance, maybe at the, uh, at the dual suns and crescent moon, uh, viewing area of the winter solstice sun. You'll know it's speculative, but you can see the sun's path from winter solstice sunrise uh, to winter solstice sunset. And then there's the Pueblo concept of, of the winter solstice and the moon god, because that's very peculiar. So the moon is also seen as an old man, but all of the moons are named and they're factoring the regulating the succession of the ceremonies, particularly at Hopi, where each ceremony is associated with a particular moon. Literally, they're, they're connected to agri uh, agrarian and uh, ceremonial uh, 
practices at all the Pueblos. Um, a historian named Stephen McCluskey notes that Hopi festivals occur within the context of a lunar calendar whose month begin at the new moon. Pro-Go Indian mindset conceptualized the new moon as the sighting of the new crescent moon in the West, not our scientific notion that the, moon, moon, the new moon occurred at the moon's first period of uh, invisibility. Jews, this period of death, I just noticed this observation. Jesus is disappears into the underworld and dies at the same amount of time that the moon actually disappears from view uh, from the eastern horizon and reappears on the western horizon as a crescent, as a waxing crescent. So all Puebloan months begin with the first appearance of the waxing crescent moon over the western horizon after sunset. The modern human, cal uh, human calendars retain the idea of the 12 moons connected to the 12 lunations of the moon in a year. So that's where we get our idea of 12 months, it comes from the 12 full lunations. So alignment with, their center, with the winter solstice sunset suggests the crescent moon is a waxing crescent that signaled the start of the new month at this petroglyph, this dual sun's crescent moon petroglyph. So you can see it right there, we're interpreting that uh, interlocking suns and that, cre that crescent moon, uh, we know that the Fremont people had a very vast knowledge of uh, lunar, uh, lunar astronomy because there's a, we found this very tiny four centimeter cross. It's about the size of maybe a half dollar, an American half dollar. You can see uh, it's on rhyolite. It shows a crescent moon what appears to be a full moon and then a waning crescent. And then it has 13 divots or circles. The Pueblo Indians tracked 13 moons instead of 12 because there's actually a 13th lunation, part of the uh, 11, there's 12 full lunations and then a 13th lunation begins to occur uh, within a 365 day uh, solar year. But one of the things that's interesting about this calendar, not only does it appear to move, mark the 13 lunations, but it also shows these 19 divots and that corresponds with the major lunar standstill. That takes 19 years to observe. And it's very likely that this little pendant is encoded with that wisdom. That, that I just described the 19 year major lunar standstill. And John Lundvall and I are writing a paper on this right now, on this one pendant. So the Hopi winter solstice ceremony, Soyal takes place during Chamoya, which is the dangerous moon. It's the moon that the Hopi have got to mind. Uh, Alexander Stephen writes that there's no work done on this moon, that it's a time when the Hopi should be afraid. The Hopi uh, priest Crow Wing notes about the winter solstice moon. He says it's the dangerous moon. Witches are around everywhere. Anyone, anyone out visiting at night should smear ashes on his forehead. Pinion gum should be put on an infant forehead and chest so the moon old man will not make off with him and basically abduct him. Girls do not grind at night. At least the dead come and do something to them. There should be no hunt. No rabbits should be hunted at this time because there's often rabbit hunts in the winter months uh, uh, because uh, the rabbits would weep. At Taos Pueblo, they say nobody may drive a wagon or automobile into town or dig a hole or sing. It's connected to the idea, you know, Florence Harley Ellis, the famous anthropologist, writes that Chamoya uh, was known as the sacred but dangerous moon because it includes the five days of imminent disaster from witchcraft, falling through the now fragile covering of the earth and other frightening possibilities. It's connected, the Puebloan connect, uh, concept is connected to the winter solstice dangerous moon, which is borrowed from prehistoric Mexico's vague year. There's the five years, so there's human beings, you know, you think of synecdoches, we don't, we don't like extra stuff. We like really concise, simple images. So a 360 day year makes sense, but those five extra days 
really mess up our calendar. And in Mexico, it was deemed uh, almost cursed days. Uh, you had to really mind yourself and just stay in your house. Um, and that concept came up with the spread of maize into the, uh, the ancient prehistoric pueblos. So we interpreted this petroglyph as saying that the winter solstice god, it, it depicts literally the stopping of the sun god, turning at his uh, winter solstice house, moving northward again, uh, bringing life to the Fremont Indian people that are living uh, at nearby Five Finger Ridge uh, community. And that the, the, the crescent moon there is a new moon and it's the dangerous moon. It's the moon that everyone needs to pay attention to so that children weren't uh, kidnapped and uh, sacrificed by the moon god and so that the community could be safe. Uh, probably staying in their homes for five days uh, during this winter solstice, this time of reverence and prayer to turn the sun god. So there it is, the interlocking suns and crescent moon petroglyph at Fremont Indian State Park. Again, it was there probably to turn the sun god. Um, but, you know, you see vestige of, his, of it other places, for instance, Stonehenge, right in your backyard. Um, it's the pan-human need to know when the sun needs to be turned and turn the sun god and even maybe even offer human sacrifice um, so that the sun god could be turned and bringing warmth again to the agrarian community at Stonehenge. But you also see it uh, in Sol Invictus, the, uh, the, the Greek and uh, Roman sun god who is the unconquered sun. Um, you had to offer prayers to bring the sun god back. You had to pray to the sun. His, uh, he's often embodied in the god Mithras in the form of the embodiment of Sol Invictus, the unconquered uncon sun. But the thing that's peculiar is Mithras's birthday is on December 25th. And that is again when the sun stops and becomes perceptibly moving northward again. It's the rebirth of the sun. The sun has not died. It is the unconquered sun. So the winter solstice, the turning of the sun god, you see it again on Jesus's birthday on December 25th. It signals the rebirth of the sun god. It's not an accident that Jesus's birthday was, was uh, uh, assigned to be December 25th. I think there I think that that, uh, that concept dates to about 334 AD. It wasn't original. It was uh, it was when right about the time of Constantine that uh, Jesus's birth became his nativity became uh, connected to the rebirth of the sun. So there you have it. You know, in the, in the Pueblo in world, you have the turning of the sun god at the winter solstice, and Greek and Roman. Uh, uh, pagan uh, solstice mythology, you have the turning of the winter solstice sun on December 25th. And in Christian mythology, you have the birth of Jesus at the rebirth of the sun god on December 25th, uh, at the time that we call Christmas the celebration of Jesus's birth. But it's all connected to this pan, it's this pan human concept that it is essential uh, that we must enact rituals, very solemn rituals, to turn the sun god on December 25th and bring him northward again at the winter solstice. And so the book's called The Celestial Code of Scripture, and that is uh, the presentation. I hope that, uh, I hope that wasn't too pedantic for esoteric viewers, Everteric Thoughts viewers, I just, I just want to link it to all humanity. We've all done this. Uh, and, you know, we still do it today. John McHugh, thank you for joining Esoteric Thoughts today. Thank you.